Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. Our tech is best in class. It's been built from the ground up. It's super easy to integrate. You can integrate the product in a few days. And we pride ourselves on good pricing for the merchant and exceptional customer service and merchant focus. But generally speaking, the reality is, I'm sure there might be some evolution in the competitive landscape over time. But for now, in 95% of cases, we're pretty much just pitching against cards. And so our value prop to the merchant is, hey, you're paying you know, 2 to 2.5% two potentially on cards for cost of processing, and we're going to charge you 1%. That was Eric Shoykett, the co-founder and CEO of Link Money, and he is my special guest this week on episode 217 of the Leaders in Payments podcast, and I'm your host, Greg Myers. Link Money provides a pay-by-bank solution in the United States that enables merchants to allow their customers to pay from their bank account as part of the standard checkout flow. They focus on e-commerce, insurance, parking, storage, and remittances, so businesses with high frequency and larger volume transactions. One of the biggest benefits of using a pay-by-bank solution like Link Money is the ability to take your transaction off the credit rails and onto the ACH rails, and it offers a more cost-effective and more secure way to pay. Eric and I go on to talk about his journey to the role of CEO, including why the U.S. tends to be so far behind in the open banking concept and where he sees the industry going in the next few years as it relates to fewer payment methods, and we talk about much, much more. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Eric. Thank you for being here, and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So let's dive right in. Tell our audience a little bit about yourself, where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that. Yeah, sure. So I grew up in uh, northern New Jersey. I went to college at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And I currently live in Miami, used to live in New York. And prior to founding Link Money, which is the current company I run, I founded a company called Adam Finance. And prior to that, I worked in the financial services space where I worked in the restructuring group at Blackstone and was also at a hedge fund called Governor's Lane. Okay. All right. We'll, we'll dive deeper into to that journey in a minute. But first, let's discuss Link Money. So tell our audience what Link Money does. Link Money provides a pay-by-bank solution in the United States, which enables merchants to allow customers to pay from their bank account in a checkout flow. And that could be a variety of merchants. It could range from things like e-commerce to insurance companies, to parking companies, to storage units, to remittances, any, any kind of space where, generally speaking, there's a decent amount of frequency of transaction, as well as a reasonably high purchase price, usually north of kind of $15 to $20. And the benefit for the merchant of using pay by bank is that they can reduce their transaction costs by anywhere from 70 to 80% and potentially higher if the transaction amount is large and the frequency is high. And so it's a great value prop for the merchant to reduce their costs of payment processing. It also results in less actual fraud because bank account-based payments are much more secure and safer than than using cards. And it also results in less involuntary and payment churn because bank accounts are stickier and people keep them open for a very long time, unlike cards which expire. So there's a very clear cost reduction and savings value proposition to the merchant. And from a customer and customer perspective, this is a very frictionless and more secure payment method than cards. Okay. Maybe walk us through what is the process? Like, how does it differ from cards for for those that may not know? Absolutely. So just for context, this is actually quite a popular payment method in other markets. So in Europe, pay by bank is is almost 20% of digital payments volume. There's markets like Brazil, where there's a payment method called PIX and UPI in India. So this is something that though new to the United States is actually taken off and, and grown very dramatically in other markets. And the way it works is quite simple. There's a button in, in the checkout flow that says pay by bank. The user clicks it. They pick their bank. They pick the icon for their bank. If they have the mobile app for their bank installed on their phone and they're going through the purchase on their phone, 
often it will deep link them to the mobile app on their phone of that bank and they can authenticate with Face ID. If they don't have that or the bank doesn't support that, they'll just enter their user credentials that may be saved already. And then they click basically pay. And once that happens, you know, we make sure that there's an, enough money in the person's account so that the merchant gets paid. We actually guarantee the funds to the merchant so they don't have to worry about if the funds are actually going to come. And so it's basically very similar to cards from a merchant perspective. And then hopefully it says transaction approved, and then that's it. And once that's done once, that flow, it functions as a stored payment method, just like a card would on the merchant site. Okay. Do you get that little pop-up screen that says, do you want to save this password, you know, that kind of this, these credentials kind of thing? So the merchant will usually ask that. So it's whatever their native flow would be. So if they have a, a flow where you pay once with the credit card and then it saves it to your profile, they'll do the same exact thing with this sort of payment method. And is the the buzzword for part of this open banking? Yeah, so that's the buzzword. It's interesting because there's actually no such thing as open banking in the United States technically. Open banking is something that exists in Europe kind of by law, which means that you can access a bunch of these banks' APIs and pull in account and user information. We have relationships with banks and partners of ours to access this information. But there actually is it's somewhat of a misnomer in the United States because there's no true legislated open banking standard or open banking access. It's actually much harder to build this in the United States because you can't just access bank account information as easily as you can in markets like Europe or India or Brazil. But fundamentally, you know, the way we think about this is this is a bank account-based payment method using bank account-based rails like ACH and potentially other rails like FedNow, if that's something that actually suits our needs and, and, and kind of jives with the requirements we have. And ultimately, for merchants, this enables them to dramatically cut their processing costs and get around the dramatically rising interchange rates that we've seen in the United States, which are quite large relative to what exists in other markets. Right. Okay. Are there certain verticals that this is better for than others? Yeah. So we tend to focus on larger transaction sizes. It doesn't have to be super large, generally around $20 plus, and where there's some repeatability of purchase. So what that means is that could be a SaaS subscription. It could be a you know Dropbox subscription or a Netflix subscription. That could just be an e-commerce website where you buy a lot, you know, something like Amazon. It could be your monthly auto pay for your storage unit. It could be your quarterly payment for your insurance premium. So there's a bunch of examples. It could be funding a wallet for your Starbucks app. So a bunch of examples where this makes sense. What we tend to avoid is one-off e-commerce transactions or, or one-off purchases that aren't, call it, in the hundreds of dollars. Because then the savings for the merchant and the discounts that the merchant can provide to the consumer make less sense. And that situation where the economics are best is obviously the larger transaction sizes that are high repeats. So something, if you think about something like remittances, where someone's sending $1,000 a month to their family in Mexico or whatever it is, you know, actually the savings there are quite large because interchange obviously scales with the transaction amount. And so those are the areas we tend to focus on most. Okay, okay. And I've always wondered this. So do the banks have to participate in this? Or if I, I'm a consumer and my bank is a, a two-branch bank in Dallas, Texas, would it participate? So we cover 95% of all U.S. bank accounts. So pretty much everyone is covered. There may be some customers, if they have a very small credit union, that's very, very hyper-local. We may not support that, but it's basically... 95% of all U.S. bank accounts. So very wide coverage. We obviously support all, any of the major banks in the United States we support, obviously, but we actually have over 5,000 banks and credit unions that we support. Okay, okay. And what is your sort of go-to-market strategy? Do you have a, a sales team? Do you work through partnerships? How do, you, how do you get your clients? Yeah, yes to both of those. So we have a sales team that comes from a payments background, places like Adyen, BNPL companies, et cetera, where they've been selling traditional payments to these sort of merchants that we tend to focus on. So that sales team has a direct merchant acquisition go-to-market. And we also have a partnerships function where we work with partners who are aligned in terms of saving merchants money and helping merchants reduce their costs of payment processing. And they often you know, refer merchants that are relevant to us where the transaction types and sizes make sense and the merchant is looking to reduce the cost of payment processing and that's a priority on their roadmap. 
Sure, sure. So, I mean, as people in the industry, we read a lot about the cost of accepting payments and how expensive it is. And obviously, you have a, a solution that is helping to solve for that. So, you're not the only ones out there with this business model. But what differentiates you from your competitors out there? Yes. Yeah, so, we, we really don't have much competition in the United States. Really, most of the pay by bank or open banking companies are, are situated in other markets like Europe. We tend to actually not see competition on deals, usually because we're focused pretty much squarely on traditional merchants. So when we pitch traditional merchants, we're really just pitching against cards. That's true in basically 95% of our deals. There is a few competitors in the United States, namely Trustly, which has a large European business. But I would say in general, our tech is best in class. It's been built from the ground up. It's super easy to integrate. You can integrate the product in a few days. And you know we pride ourselves on good pricing for the merchant and exceptional customer service and merchant focus. But generally speaking, the reality is, I'm sure there might be some evolution in the competitive landscape over time. But for now, in 95% of cases, we're pretty much just pitching against cards. And so our value prop to the merchant is, hey, you're paying you know two to 2.5% two potentially on cards for cost of processing, and we're going to charge you 1%. So you, you're going to capture that savings and you can deliver some of those economics back to the customer. So it, it seems like a no-brainer. Why would a merchant not want to do this? The devil's in the details. I mean, there may be other things on the roadmap that are higher priority. There's certain verticals where maybe adoption might be less. So the, the total savings for the merchant aren't enough to justify adding this in. Some merchants just want to be slower on new payment methods and, and things of this sort. So usually, you know, the value props of the merchant is compelling. And then it'll kind of boil down to, you know, is this sort of the merchant where cost of payment processing is a priority? Can this be higher on the roadmap versus other things? And that's usually the, the discussions we have with merchants to see if it makes sense. But the overall value prop is, is generally very clear and compelling for most merchants. And so it's just a question of how important is this for them right now? And does the math make enough sense to prioritize this sort of project? Right, right. And I think one of the other the beauties of this as a as a newer payment method, it's sort of not the, the the classical chicken and the egg, right? So new payment method merchants say, oh, there's not enough people using it, so we don't want to do it. And then consumers say, there's not enough merchants that accept this, so I don't want to do it. I guess that problem just doesn't exist in this model. Yeah, that's what's beautiful about this because we cover, this works via existing bank accounts. So all cost, basically all consumers of the merchant can use this payment method as it stands. So that's not an issue. And so it's just a question of us getting merchants to add this into their checkout flow. And then ultimately, there are benefits, obviously, to consumers. This is a more secure payment method. It's pretty frictionless if the Face ID option is there, meaning you have the bank's mobile app on, on your phone. And so you actually don't even have to enter card information. So you have more security. You have less friction from a consumer perspective. But the most important driver here, especially for the verticals we're focused on, is merchant-driven adoption. And so the merchant has every incentive to push as much volume off of card rails and off of more expensive payment methods onto this and therefore incentivize customers in the right way, whether that's monetary or CRM or UX, to push them to adopt this sort of payment method. So you don't have that sort of chicken and egg problem, as you mentioned. Yeah, and do you see... Do you see merchants taking the savings and investing it back into trying to push people to use this method? Yeah, so that's generally what we've seen. We tend to work with enterprise merchants who are a bit more sophisticated. So they have a good understanding of their different cohorts. So they know, hey, these people are using debit. These people are using credit. It costs us this. This is the average purchase price. This is the frequency of purchase. And so they can get a sense of the LTV of those savings. And then they can do the math on what makes sense to deliver back to the customer. So generally, yes, that is the expectation. It'll differ by merchant. You know, the more... Re repeat the purchase, the larger the amount, and the more that it is on credit, let's say, which is even higher cost of processing, the more the incentive can be for the merchant to give that back to the customer to drive them to use pay by bank. So it'll depend on the details, but ultimately, this is pro-consumer as well, because obviously, the consumer will share in some of these savings. Right, right. Well, where do you see the payments industry heading, say, in the next two to three years? So I think if you zoom back out, there's been a real change in landscape from a merchant perspective and how they think about payments. I'd say five years ago, the consensus was, let's add every single payment method under the sun. And the most important thing is consumer choice and giving them every option. 
I think that mentality has completely shifted. Part of that is due to the weak macro environment. And merchants are now thinking about, okay, cost of payment processing is super high. That partly also has to do with interchange rates that are pretty much at record levels. And so everyone's now looking at cost of payment processing as a line item that they can cut. And that obviously isn't just revenue. That's you know true cost out. And so that goes right to the bottom line. So it's a very attractive line item to, to reduce. And so I think the new mentality is, let's cut our cost of payment processing. Let's actually have fewer payment methods with larger share of our checkout and focus around what actually we need to have. Because I think people have learned that you know, when you add Apple Pay, you're basically cannibalizing card volumes and you're actually paying more, right? So you're basically adding an additional fee and basically what ends up happening is people who are going to pay with card use Apple Wallet, Apple Pay because it's slightly more convenient, right? So I think merchants have realized this and they're trying to now focus around, okay, what are the, the few payment methods that we really need that actually will result in people not dropping off in the checkout flow, obviously, but have a lower cost of payment processing. So I think that's been a fundamental transition in psychology among merchants. And we're seeing that continue to accelerate as the macro remains weak and people are focused on cost reduction. And I think, look, ultimately, I think it's pretty inevitable that pay by bank is going to have a significant amount of payment volume in the United States and share capture from cards over the next 10 years. I think if you look at every other market that is ahead of the US, which tends to be the case in payments, that's been the reality. The US has been slower because the the tech and, and the access has been harder to piece together and merchants haven't been as eager to push this. But I think with this recent change in merchant psychology, as well as merchants looking at this taking off in other markets, that kind of becomes inevitable. Because you know, if you also think about it, a lot of the merchants we deal with also have businesses in Europe, right? And so they offer pay by bank in their European market. And so when you go to them and you say, hey, I have pay by bank for the United States, they're not totally clueless as to what that means. They actually know how it works. They've seen the adoption curve in Europe. They know it's cheaper. And so they're much more willing to give it a shot because it's not really a totally new payment method to them. It's just new in this market, but they're very aware because they're using this in Europe, they're using UPI in India, they're using PIX in Brazil. And so they have a good sense of, of what this means for their business. Okay. Is, is there a future where we'll be able to pay by bank in a retail setting? Yeah. So we have a function where the merchant can, we call it dynamic links. So the merchant can text you or email you a URL, you click it on your phone, and then it'll take you through the payment flow. That same flow I described earlier where you pick your bank, you put in your credentials or authenticate with face ID, and then it should say payment successful. So you can do in-person payments using this. Part of the issue with in-person is obviously you have to integrate in certain cases into POS systems. So that's more of a kind of a go-to-market question and getting deals with these POS providers or vertical SaaS platforms. But merchants who have in-person use cases can absolutely use link money pay by bank and you know message via text or email a URL to the customer, and then they can go through the payment flow for that relevant payment amount. So works perfectly for in-person use cases as well. Do you see much of that today? Yeah, so we're, we're actually live with, with certain use cases for that. We, we actually have dentist clinics using this for customers to pay. So there's a bunch of use cases where this is relevant. I'd say the main, the main product remains you know, the digital checkout flow. But we expect in-person to accelerate and some merchants are actually using in-person first before they actually add it to the digital checkout flow because it's actually easier and quicker to integrate because it doesn't require really any change to their flow on their website or, or whatever. They can just add, have the customer service or, or their CRM system just leverage our API and send out these payment links um, individually. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. So if you don't mind, and you mentioned a little bit earlier, some of the roles that you had in the past, but maybe walk us through your professional journey, you know, up to the point where you are today. Yeah. So I've, I've always been, you know, super passionate about finance and investing. So worked at Blackstone after college and then went into a public markets investing role at a hedge fund. And when I was there, I covered a bunch of different spaces, but uh, focused a lot on financials and payments. So I'm actually quite familiar with it from an investor perspective. And I've seen the evolution of you know fintech and payments in some of these other markets, including in Europe. And you know, I just got the itch to be an operator. I think investors often are captive to kind of sitting back and thinking about businesses, but 
they don't tend to have actual in the trenches operant experience. And I always felt that the ability to have that sort of experience would ultimately make me a much better investor. So I wanted to get some ops experience, partnered with a friend of mine to start Adam Finance when I left the hedge fund industry, which is a financial data platform and intelligence layer for investment research and market monitoring. And that was obviously relevant to the background that I had prior to that. So that was the first company I started. It's based in New York. And then after that, you know, decided to take the plunge and focus on this pay by bank and opportunity in the United States because I thought it was so compelling and thought the timing was right to push this new payment method. So that was really the evolution. I've now been lucky enough to have been in the trenches for a while. And I can confidently say it does make you a more effective investor and, and student of businesses if you actually have operating experience. Okay. Was there anything specific about the pay by bank that, I mean, it just felt like the right opportunity in the right time? Yeah, I think the you know my conviction was helped a lot by the evolution I saw in Europe and just the feeling that the setup in the US was so good. It's it's you know a larger market from a payments volume perspective. The interchange rates are much 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 higher. There's way less competition and you know adoption in the US for payments tends to actually just follow some of these other markets on a lag because we tend to be more fragmented in terms of the banks and 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 stickier in terms of our habits, and and there's less regulation pushing these things. But ultimately felt that it was an inevitability that pay by bank would grow in this market. And the timing made sense for the launch of Link Money. And candidly, the the other piece of this is that if you think about the value chain in, in the US, there's very little incentive for some of the existing players to push a cheaper payment method. If you look at the card networks or existing merchant acquirers, they're already getting that volume. Uh, and actually, it's better to have your take rate be a little piece of a much larger cost of payments because it's not as noticed and it makes it easier to hike prices. And so there's not the incentive in terms of these existing players in the payments landscape in the US to push cheaper cost of payments and help merchants drive cost of payments down. And so you really need a new player who is acquiring these merchants greenfield to, you know, who has the incentive to capture this volume and do so at a lower cost. Okay. And when you started the company, you know, typically uh, when there's a co-founder involved, one is more the business side, one's more the technical side. Is that true in this case as well? No. So both of us come from more of a, I'd say, business and strategic background. We brought in some great engineering folks early here. Our engineering and, and product team come from places like Zelle and eBay and Amazon. So they all have very, very deep payments experience. They've been doing payments for, you know, in, in some cases, decades. And so we brought those sort of senior folks in very early, both myself and my co-founder, Edward Lando. You know, this isn't our first company and, and we have experience hiring, you know, seasoned folks that have the right background for, you know, this kind of enterprise grade business. So wasn't as much of an issue, but uh, yeah, f- sometimes in, in, in these sort of situations, you do see obviously one technical co-founder. Okay. Well, what are some things you're passionate about? So maybe one business related passion and one personal passion. Business related is is definitely investing. I'm definitely a public markets junkie. Love following companies and learning about businesses. Personal, I would say skiing. Huge skier. I played ice hockey growing up. Started skating when I was two years old, and have picked up skiing the last several years. And you know, I think it's an awesome way to detach and relax. And when you're on the slopes, it's it's easy to not think about work as much and 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 just focus on you and the mountain. So love skiing and, and think it's an awesome sport. Okay. Okay. You know, I always like to to ask this question because I think everyone has their sort of own unique experiences. And and so I think that the answers are always interesting. You know, and I started in payments in 2004. I just fell into it and never really got out of it. It wasn't like I went into it with a career like today. People can take fintech courses in college. And I think they look at our industry, payments, if you want to call it that, or fintech or even broadly financial services and say, hey, there's a there's a career there for me. So the question is, what advice would you give someone coming into our industry? You know, they want to build a career in it. What would you tell them they need to do to be successful? I think it's super important to understand the value chain of payments. I I think payments is one of those spaces where I think people don't actually know how it works. Who are the different players? What's interchanged? Where's the money going in terms of the economics? So I think it's really important at a base level, foundational level to actually like deconstruct the value chain and understand 
who are the different players, what are the, their different economics, why is it set up this way, and really actually go back and study the history. You know, how did people used to pay before, you know, debit cards? People were using checks, things like that. What is, you know, where did these things come from? What's the history of ACH? So I think it's really important to go back and, and study the history and, and get a grasp of the value chain at a foundational level. And I think there's actually a lot of people in the space that don't have that sort of understanding. And I think if you have that first principles understanding, it just makes you a much more effective participant in the space. So, you know, there's a variety of resources you can, you can research and, and there's some, some books on the history of payments, but I, I really think that's super important. And there's a lot of people that, again, lack that sort of foundational understanding and that just will make you a more effective whether it's a leader or operator or, or, you know, just participant in the, in the space. Sure, sure. So, Eric, we've covered a lot of ground so far about the company and the market and, and some of your, your personal interests. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, really appreciate the, the opportunity to come on here. Would love folks to, to check us out. Link Money is the name of the company. Again, we offer a pay-by-bank solution where you can reduce your cost of payment processing by 70%. And it's great for merchants and great for customers. So we'd love to have you reach out and, and chat with our sales team. Okay. And the easiest way is just to go to the website, I assume. Yep. You go to the website, there's a contact us form and, and the sales team will take it from there. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Eric, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know your time is very valuable, so I really appreciate you being here. Thanks very much for having me. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 